the life of Christ is measured from the time of Christ's conception in the Annunciation right through to his ascension when he returns to his father after his passion, death and resurrection. It's a period of 33 years, quite a short period, and we can date it exactly. And most of it, interestingly, was called the hidden life, the first 30 years when he lived with his, his parents, Joseph and Mary, and mainly in Nazareth, in the town of Nazareth, in the north of the, the Holy Land, although he spent some time on pilgrimage to um, Jerusalem in Judea and some time in exile in Egypt as a baby. The next three years after that represent his public ministry when he bursts onto the scene of history. And those three years are particularly important and we hear a lot about them in the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke and John. And then right at the end you have that climactic period where he dies in his passion and he rises again and then 40 days later he ascends to his father. It all happens rather quickly at the end. Most countries in the world measure their time by the coming of Christ. They use the words AD, Anno Domini, from the Latin, the year of the Lord, not after Christ, but the year of the Lord, because it's a, a belief that Jesus is still living and reigning. It's quite remarkable to think that when we put the date down, even on a, a check or a, a piece of paper, a form that we fill in, we're kind of making an act of faith. His coming, historically, has changed the whole world, and even for those who do not have faith in him. Giotto shows us the moment, the start of Holy Week, Christ's entry into Jerusalem. I love the way that Giotto has concentrated on the humanity of the scene. The donkey is presented in wonderful naturalistic detail. It's also interesting the way that Giotto juxtaposes Christ and his followers tightly bunched on one side of the composition with the people of Jerusalem on the other. It's almost a moment of standoff or encounter. The people of Jerusalem, of course, are cheering and welcoming the arrival of Christ. A man prostrates himself to put down his gown for the ass to tread on. Others are climbing trees as if to get a better view or to pull down branches to wave. I think Giotto perhaps is hinting at what is to come, however, when the people of Jerusalem turned against Christ. In his public ministry, Jesus does several things at once. First, he reveals who he is, that he's no ordinary man. He says, before Abraham existed, I am. That phrase, ego eimi in Greek, I am, is the word for God in the Old Testament. I am who I am. He said, I saw Satan fall from heaven like lightning. He tells us that he existed before the world. He also reveals his mission, that he came to bring the reign of God, the kingdom of God. And he casts out demons to show the dispelling of evil. And he works miracles to show there's a new future for humanity. He also reveals his new doctrine, a doctrine of divine love, not just keeping the law, but of loving as God loves. And then he founds his church to perpetuate his mission, chooses his apostles to be on the 12 thrones of the 12 tribes of Israel and a leading apostle to be his prime minister, Peter, who is his first pope and makes him the key bearer. Caravaggio was commissioned to do this painting for the church of San Luigi de Francese in Rome where it stays today. Caravaggio depicts the dramatic moment when Christ comes to call for Matthew to join him. Caravaggio sets the scene inside. Matthew and his tax collecting colleagues are in darkness. Light enters dramatically with Christ's arrival. We follow the line of Christ's arm towards Matthew, the dramatic pointing gesture of Christ and I like the human element where Matthew looks as if to say, who me? I think Caravaggio deliberately here alludes to the image of the hands painted by Michelangelo on the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel. If we look closely at the hand of Christ, it closely mirrors that of Adam and emphasises, I think, 
Christ's role as a second Adam. Caravaggio was a master of manipulating light and darkness, and I think we see it here brilliantly in this composition. People often ask, how do we know Jesus Christ? Well, there are three ways. The first is through reason. We can study history, we can go deep into the history of those times. We know a lot about Jesus Christ. In fact, more than most figures of ancient history because there are 27 documents written about him in an eyewitness period. We call them the New Testament. They're not one thing, they're 27 documents written in different ways by different people. They could be checked by friend and foe alike, but they all support each other, even though they're coming from different places and not always using the same sources. We also have records from non-Christian writers who speak of Jesus, Josephus, Tacitus, Pliny the Younger, Suetonius, and then we have all the writings of the early church from the second century onwards who speak of Christ. So there's a lot of secular evidence and we can study the archaeology and the history of the Jewish and Roman times of the first century. But that's not enough on its own, knowing about Jesus. The second way we can know Jesus is by faith, that by a gift we believe we assent to his coming, we believe what he taught. When he says things like, I am the light of the world, we believe it. We believe him to be the Lord and the Saviour of the world. That doesn't come by our study, it's a response to him and it's a way of knowing him. When we recite the creed, the things about him, we say, I believe that. The third way of knowing is perhaps the most important, but it follows the others. It's to know him personally that we believe he still lives, that he didn't die again when he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven, but he's with us always to the end of time, that we can actually relate to him, speak to him, we can have a personal relationship with him, and particularly for Catholics in the Mass, when we receive his body and blood, soul and divinity into ourselves, there's no great, greater bond than that.